Thank you, Maggie. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Kirby. I am the Assistant Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection's Bureau of Air and Waste. I am very pleased to welcome you to the stakeholder meeting as we continue our process to gather input into developing proposed regulations for including cumulative impact analyses, referred to as CIA, in certain categories of air permits. This is our sixth set of meetings, and we will hold another session tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. The development of the CIA regulations is a priority of the department and the Commonwealth. Also, getting input from all interested parties is a priority, and we want to ensure that all interested stakeholders with, a, with, a, with an interest in the regulations we propose are engaged in this important process. As we have said in previous sessions, we have reached out to the environmental stakeholder community, municipalities, the regulated community, environmental and business organizations, and especially communities with environmental justice populations and organizations to participate in this process. Again, we are happy to see you here again today. Next slide, please. Since our last session, we have made considerable progress. And today we will be presenting an overview and looking for feedback on the draft cumulative impact analysis framework. This framework will serve as the basis for our proposed regulations. In this session, we will be reviewing the main elements of the framework, including the proposed CIA applicability that will define what permit it covers and what geographic areas it applies to. It will also include procedures for pre-application community notice and engagement, requirements to describe and analyze existing community conditions, the analytical steps to be included in CIA and an applicable air permit, and finally, the permit and public process, public comment process. Next slide. Where are we? So Mass DEP started holding monthly stakeholder meetings last August, and our plan is to propose regulations by October. We will be holding additional meetings on our draft regulations, as well as guidance, and we'll post these meetings on our website when we have those planned. Next slide. As you know, the climate law directed Mass DEP to incorporate cumulative impact analyses into certain air permits by the end of this year through a public engagement process. The law also had separate requirements for the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, known as MEPA, as shown on this slide. MEPA regulations were actually amended in December of 2021 to add the requirements relative to environmental justice in accordance with the requirements of the climate legislation. MEPA is moving on to a phase two regulatory review effort, which may include refinements to its approach to environmental justice considerations. MEPA is partnering with MassDEP's CIA work in light of potential overlap between CIA and MEPA's EJ framework. Information on how to stay apprised of that effort will be provided at the end of this presentation. Next slide. Actually, I don't think this is my slide, you can go back. So one thing I do wanna mention is um, what we're calling a program review. As you can see in the draft framework, MassDEP is anticipating including a program review in the proposed regulations and ultimately the final regulations. This is consistent with many of our other regulatory programs. The current draft CIA framework reflects the first phase of regulations for incorporating CIA in air permits. It's important to note that MassDEP is committed to and follows national and state efforts to better develop our programs and also follows the science and research as it evolves, particularly in this important area. After a program review is completed, a second phase of the regulations could include more detailed requirements to analyze and assess the cumulative impacts of applicable air permits, such as how additional air pollution would affect existing environmental burdens in a community. We appreciate your partnership in exploring this very complex topic of including CIA in the air permit process. Thank you for your participation 
And I will now turn it over to Joanne Morin. Thank you, Christine. So, so I, I want to just uh, briefly um, go over a few um, examples of cumulative impact analysis. Uh, these um, concepts have been used in the US and internationally to evaluate large infrastructure projects, you know, highways and mines and dams. And, and for instance, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, we have our own um, Massachusetts NEPA, but the national one has used, you know, cumulative impact analysis in the evaluation of environmental effects of large projects. So these examples that exist here, Minnesota is required by statute to analyze the cumulative levels and effects of past and current pollution before a permit may be issued which includes evaluation of environmental health data, community stressors and vulnerabilities, as well as nearby sources and modeling results for air toxics and criteria pollutants. The permit is still issued based on compliance with national ambient air quality standards and an air toxics risk assessment. New Jersey also passed a 2020 EJ statute and uses a comparative analysis impact approach in certain permit decisions. The law does not specify a cumulative impact analytical method for air emissions specifically, but instead it specifies that a project impact that causes or contributes to identified uh, stressors in overburdened communities that are higher than those borne by other communities can lead to denial of, of a permit. By statute, it's based on a comparison between different areas of the state. California defines cumulative impacts as exposures and including environmental pollution from all sources and including socioeconomic factors. And they use a scoring rubric. You know, as, as uh, many people are familiar with, California Enviroscreen screen to compare communities. And they're using it to allocate funding, direct program resources, but are not currently using it to really make permit decisions. So these current examples of cumulative impact uh, analysis have not taken cumulative air emissions from a facility and distinguished or quantified their specific impact on, on the existing community's air quality or their impact on health-related vulnerabilities, except in a very general sense. And EPA is recognizing this and they are now undergoing a research effort to develop approaches to address cumulative impacts and risks. Mass D, you know, our DEP's uh, proposed approach to cumulative impact analysis and air permitting is to use an analytical approach that will evaluate the potential impacts of the proposed projects, air emissions, in or near EJ populations, while also considering how existing environmental, public health, and socioeconomic stressors affect community conditions. So these are the major steps um, uh, that we're anticipating within a cumulative impact analysis. We went over these in January. So what I'd just like to point out is that um, today we're gonna really focus on the, uh, give additional uh, detail, particularly on the first three steps, the pre-application of community notice and engagement, the second step, of assessing existing community conditions. And this also came out in the agenda that Christine just went through. And the third step, at analyzing impacts of existing and added air pollution. And then towards the end of the presentation, we also will review the, the public process as well. And as Chris, Christine pointed out that uh, that's very important is that we are planning on putting into the regs a future, future program review. And this is, again, because of the importance of the research that's going on um, and the complexity of trying to uh, more specifically relate and quantify the impacts of cumulative analytical methods to specific community uh, conditions. In terms of applicability, um, this, our applicability uh, that we are proposing for CIAs 
would be would be required for those uh, facilities that have a comprehensive plan approval or applying for a comprehensive plan approval for any new facility in or near an environmental justice population within a one mile for a non-major CPA or within five miles of a major CPA. So I'm just gonna go ahead for a slide and then I'm gonna come back to the slide. So in terms of the thresholds, we've gone through before we went through our permitting uh, process in earlier presentations, but what are those thresholds? So for non-major comprehensive plan approval, it is you know for process emissions greater than 10 tons and for certain combustion units, fuel burning combustions, you know, like a boiler, uh, um, a, you know, a, a turbine or a engine of, the, of burning certain amounts of fuel. And then uh, things like incinerators and so, and like non-emergency engines, except for very small ones that are limited in hours. And then for major comprehensive plan approvals. Now this is very, very large facilities. These are the Clean Air Act uh, major uh, thresholds. So these are, are very significant um, uh, facilities and um, impacts. So those are those are the thresholds. So for for anything with a CPA in a non-major uh, comprehensive plan approval or within a mile of a environmental justice population or within five miles of a major comprehensive plan approval, five miles of a comprehensive plan approval. But for an existing facility that already has a comprehensive plan approval, if they, if they require, if they are, um, if they are applying for a new piece of equipment or is modifying the equipment that's already in an existing comprehensive plan approval, a CIA would be required if that new or modified comprehensive plan approval would increase emissions above a de minimis level, which we were proposing here one ton per year. So those would be the applicability for a, a CIA. So the emphasis for this applicability is a focus on environmental justice population Populations acknowledge the importance of protecting those populations from added environmental burdens, similar to MEPA's new environmental justice assessment regulations, as well as increased emissions. Comprehensive plan approvals are required for those emission sources that pose a greater potential impact on air quality. Also, uh, we want to note that we are distinguishing increases because we you know, replacing older equipment with less polluting equipment that would decrease emissions uh, would have no cumulative impacts to analyze. You know, the impacts are reduced and we really want to avoid creating a disincentive for beneficial projects that actually decrease emissions um, uh, that, would, that would be a benefit to those um, nearby communities. So in addition, we do want to point out also uh, in terms of modifications to CPAs that result in a de minimis increase um, that would not require a CIA. Um, we do have our current notifications to EJ uh, populations that require uh, involvement and notification to EJ uh, public involvement and notification and um, uh, fact sheets to those commuted communities and that uh, Mass DEP will retain uh, the right to require to on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and depending on public input on whether a CIA uh, would be needed. So there would be that allowance as well if a community felt a CIA was, was needed uh, below the de minimis level. So as we mentioned, the first step in the process uh, for a CIA would be a pre-application notice. So we're proposing 60 days prior to submitting an application. The applicant would be required to provide public notice of the project to, to DEP, as well as to the uh, Mass DEP Environmental Justice Director, the affected environmental justice populations and local officials to seek input on the project. We will be developing guidance on this. 
that would include requiring a fact sheet to send out to the community and, and specific um, guidance on how to actively engage with the affected community. Um, and this would be uh, similar to MEPA's uh, new pre-filing environmental justice community engagement. So um, I think I will stop there and open it up for questions about anything I've spoken about and any questions you'd like to give to any of us. So I'm gonna stop there. And if you'd like to either raise your hand or place a question in the chat, and ERG will will look for the chat, but give you a minute to get your thoughts together. And it looks like there is one. We have a few, yeah, we have a few raised hands. Um, Stephen Chiron, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask your question or, or comment verbally. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Joanne. Uh, question around the applicability. Um, could you? Go in a little more detail why for existing sites, uh, limited plan approvals um, seem to be subject to the CIA um, in projects of that size or not under the new, if it's a new source. Um, it just seems in, in reading the document, I know you have further parts of the presentation, but I mean, you're trying to implement an incredibly complex um, new set of regulations um, that you're already are recognizing that is going to be a couple iterations um, and revisions or different phases to kind of get these implemented. It seems like, I mean, I don't know if the science is there supporting like a two ton project um, is, is really leading to degradation of the air quality, um, especially if on sites with larger, larger acreage, probably on the fence line, there's probably no change in, in concentrations or anything. So just looking for a little more insight around that, why it's so low. And then secondly, I didn't see anything in terms of applicability in the write-up regarding um, temporary sources or emergency sources, uh, because this process is gonna be pretty extensive, um, both in terms of uh, cost to the uh, stakeholders or the um, regulated community. And in addition, it's gonna take quite a lot of time to get something through here. So. Um, we occasionally have things pop up where you know a piece of equipment goes down and we have to bring out a temporary one for a couple months to uh, to stem the the time until that other one is fixed. And um, you know we would be looking for something in the regulations that would allow that to occur without having to go through this whole process. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I Steve, this is Glenn Keith. Um, let me try to answer that first question on the uh, thresholds. Um, you know, for, as you can see, the, the applicability includes a, a new facility. So it's brand new. There's no emissions from the facility. And then if you're trigger the CPA thresholds, um, you know, in or near the EJ population, you would, the CIA would apply in terms of existing facilities. Um, you know, we, one thought was, well, if you're doing an LPA sized project and these are you know, projects that are below uh, CPA thresholds, you know, should you have to do a CIA? And we decided to say that, at least in this proposal, that if you're gonna increase more than a de minimis amount, and that de minimis is already in our regulations for permits. Um, although, as you pointed out, if you're over one ton, you'd initially be in the uh, limited plant approval category. But you have to keep in mind, there's already a facility there that's meeting CPA uh, threshold, so you're adding to an existing facility. Um, so that was the kind of the thought process behind it. It's not um, the same as the a new facility. You don't have the emissions, and you're adding what could be potentially significant emissions. In the second scenario, for an existing facility, you already have a facility that's em emitting, you know, potentially significant emissions that never went through a cumulative impact analysis because you know they were permitted prior to this new requirement so you know you've already got a, a an emissions kind of baseline there and so we felt that any increase that would be you know more than de minimis would warrant looking at you know the existing emissions plus the new emissions and um so that that was the thought process there 
And uh, could you could you remind us of your second question? Um, the other oh, question. Temporary. I'm temporary sorry. Temporary. 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 Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, if there's an emergency situation, you know, you wouldn't have to go through the normal uh, permitting process potentially. So, I think emergencies and temporary situations would have to be handled on a case by case basis. Um, you know, our regular our our comprehensive plan approval process is really designed for more permanent sources. So, I, I don't know if you have. If you have want to add more detail that to that question, not sure, you know, it would be it would be case by case, but um, I don't know if you have a specific scenario in mind. Um, I mean, an example I, I would see would be something where um, power supplies go down and a temporary generator is brought in, or in the scenarios that I work in, um, in the in the fuel uh, terminals that um, you know are are. are Iraq emissions are controlled through a vapor recovery unit. Um, that unit goes down. Then we're bringing on a temporary vapor combustion unit to uh, to deal with the emissions. Um, the control technology efficiency stays the same, but one is powered by electricity, one by more than likely propane. So all of a sudden, you know, you're you're not increasing VOC emissions, but you are going to have NOx emissions that probably go above one ton. Ten, uh, one ton if you're out there for a couple months. Um, and we would need to do that, you know, immediately. Yeah, yeah. But I think in that specific scenario, you, you probably it wouldn't require a CIA as this is proposed because you wouldn't have to modify an existing CPA in that type of situation, even though you're going to temporarily be emitting more than one ton at a CPA permitted facility. Um, this is where you're actually, you know, modifying the comprehensive plan approval and you're going through the uh, CPA permit process. But, you know, again, these would be have to be dealt with on a case by case basis. But I don't think we were thinking about short term emergency type, you know, uh, situations. Hi, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I didn't see the raise hand thing. So um, this is Lisa Modica. This is kind of a strange situation. And, I, you know, I think it's something that I'm going to encounter soon. So I have an existing Title V facility, okay? And it wants to make a very, very, very small change. The equipment that it's going to make the small change is permitted under a non-major comprehensive. And the DP's policy has been, if you're modifying a non-comprehensive, you do a non-comprehensive. So we're in non-comprehensive plan approval. The purpose of this change is to address opacity control and emissions will be less than a ton per year. Would a source like this be subject to the comprehensive impact analysis? Um, not as this is proposed, because in that case, you're not increasing emissions or if there's a, a minor increase, you know, it would be very minor uh, because as you point out, we do have a lot of uh, existing facilities that have comprehensive plan approvals and often they they need to change something, um, whether it's equipment, uh, even even to you know get a, a lower emission rate, you have to go through the comprehensive plan approval process. That's just the way our regs are structured. So what we're proposing is those types of changes that are not increase making resulting in a significant increase in emissions would not require a cumulative impact analysis. Thank you very much for clarifying. Great. Next, we'll move on to Jay Andrew Irwin. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, I, I have two, two lines. One is on the um, de minimis aspect of, you know, when we have de minimis unaggregated emissions, those kick into a non-major comprehensive plan at 10 tons, right, Glenn? Right. So why would we not have a similar aggregation threshold for review applying to those limited emissions on an existing source. So you're again taking your, your concern with having a one ton uh, change at facility triggering a cumulative impact analysis if it's Correct. an existing facility. And I, I think the point is we already have the framework that is existing uh, with regard to aggregation 
of unaggregated emissions to a point of hitting a trigger threshold and then going into non-major comprehensive review. Seems to make sense. Yeah. And, and again, you know, that's that's similar to saying, well, if, if you know, we'd apply the CPA thresholds for an existing facility, but then again, the concern was you've already got a, a, a facility with a comprehensive plan approval, and now you're essentially adding what amounts to a, a an additional CPA sized project in terms of potential emissions, and you're you're in or near an environmental justice areas, um, so. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly looking for feedback on this proposal, so um, it would be really helpful to, you know, or, you know, to hear it now as we're doing, but also to submit um, written comments on, on all of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the other is on the um, fact sheet. Is that going to be going in any different direction than what we've seen on uh, fact sheets so far on non-major comprehensive plans? Um, well, we haven't gotten that far, but we were thinking that, you know, we already do require uh, a fact sheet regarding the project as part of the environmental justice um, for, uh, community involvement. And that's at the point of application. But this outreach is 60 days even prior to applying. So it may be just moving that fact sheet requirement 60 days prior, but it could be very similar. But the idea was you wouldn't provide the fact sheet. You wouldn't wait to applying for a permit. Um, this requires outreach to the community um, before you apply for a permit because you're gonna have to get community um, involvement anyways to develop the cumulative impact analysis. So I, I think it's really moving that initial public outreach and fact sheet. It may be the same type of fact sheet, but moving it 60 days prior to application instead of at the point of application. And one last item, which is that on occasion, the department in an enforcement action will require a facility to follow, file a non-major comprehensive plan for a source that otherwise would qualify as a limited plan. How are we going to coordinate that? Yeah. Um, the idea here was it, it's not so much the flavor of the CPA, it's the uh, CPA potential emissions categories. So if you wouldn't, if, you, if the potential emissions don't meet the uh, CPA thresholds, but you have to do a CPA for a different reason, then that might be uh, an, a specific exemption from the cumulative impact analysis. I, I guess that, that's a great clarification. Let's, let's make sure that that gets memorialized or that that's considered in, in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions, Andrew. Um, next, we'll move on to a few questions that were submitted in the chat. This one asks, could you give an example or two of a situation where a community could legitimately request a CIA for an existing facility making changes that increase emissions below the de minimis threshold? A specific example, is that the question in the chat? Yeah, could you give an example or two of a situation? Well, I mean, I guess it could be any any facility doing any with any kind of emissions. Um, it's really going to be, I guess, depending on the community concern. So, um, you know, if you're if you're take, making a change and you're burning fossil fuel uh, fossil fuels, well, you know, you're going to have one set of emissions. Another situation might be where the uh, emissions are actually um, hazardous air pollutants. So it's it's kind of hard to give a specific example, but I, I think, you know, what we were just trying to do is, is, is communicate the fact that even though you wouldn't require a, a cumulative impact analysis in the regulations, you know, there is a role for community involvement in, in these in facilities as well. And if the community is particularly concerned and there seems to be a legitimate reason for that, then uh, the department could require a cumulative impact analysis. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, this next part is a few questions in one, so um, we can address them one by one. So the first one is, who is responsible for verifying that the applicant has contacted the actual impacted EJ populations? Well, part of the process is that, you know, in addition to doing the outreach, they would have to, the applicant would have to document what was done 
And we, there's also um, in the, uh, the accompanying write up to the slides, there'd be a requirement um, to, to actually have a pre application meeting with DEP to kind of talk about what the community outreach is going to be. And um, so I th it's, it's on, it's a responsibility of the applicant, but DEP would be reviewing what the applicant has done as part of the uh, cumulative impact analysis, you know, report and application. And I imagine there could be ongoing communication as there often is in any permitting situation between the applicant and DEP. And in, as well, you know, involvement with our uh, environmental justice director, uh, Deneen Simpson, so that they're, if the community, you know, doesn't feel like they've been, these requirements have been met, they can certainly reach out to DEP or uh, Deneen and then we could um, work with the applicant. Um, but hopefully, you know, if we provide some guidance and um, the applicant would, you know, conduct the community out, outreach to the uh, community, um, it's in their interest to do that if they want to, you know, get an approval of their cumulative impact analysis report and permit application. Great. Um, the next question says, what happens if the applicant's pre-application efforts slash processes are not satisfactory as far as meaningful community engagement is concerned? They, well, they may in that case have to do additional community outreach. I guess we would have to cross that bridge when we get there. Okay. Um, and the last question here says, what does Mass DEP and MEPA consider to be meaningful outreach and EJ community involvement? I, I think one aspect is it is is you know obviously identifying members of the con uh, community that are concerned and actually um, potentially meeting with them and hearing their concerns and providing information about the project through a fact sheet or other means and taking into account and soliciting comments, making sure that everyone has access to the information about the project that could include language translation, et cetera. So I think, you know, we're, we'll be developing guidance on this, but, um, you know, in the MEPA process, they've already done something similar uh, where there is some guidance and um, MEPA is getting experience as under their regulations as projects that trigger the new EIR requirement um, involve this uh, community engagement. So it's something we're going to have to uh, develop and uh, have criteria for. Glenn, I would just add that we, we were already doing some of this work and the, the public outreach and fact sheets through air permits right now. So we'll be building on that process as, 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 as has been mentioned. Great. Thank you both. Um, next, we'll move on to Stephen Tyrone. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, Glenn. If uh, if you have a project that has uh, increased emissions from from some new sources, but you're also decreasing emissions with other changes at the facility, are these thresholds for applicability based on the net emissions from the project that's being submitted to DEP? Yeah, I mean, I think conceptually the idea was if you're, you know, you may be closing down one unit, but adding a, a, un a unit next to it that's cleaner. So you're having a net decrease in emissions and you still trigger the CPA based on the new unit. You know, DEP wants to review that, make sure there's best available control technology, et cetera. But it, yes, it, it's on a net basis. Um, you know, so that overall there's a reduction of the emissions in the facility. Thanks. Great, thank you, Stephen, for your question. Next, we'll move on to J. Andrew Irwin. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I was going to ask the exact same question as Stephen. So uh, that's very important that the the netting of, of beneficial change, because in federal reporting, you can't necessarily net things out to figure which category you're in. So in this case, the idea that I can net out to having overall lower or equal emissions and not trigger this review, I think is an important clarification. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and you know, in, in Mass DEP's air permitting, you also cannot net out to, to avoid a CPA, but the cumulative impact analysis is different. We're trying to account for the fact that if 
emissions are decreasing, then there, there there's no cumul additional cumulative impacts, but you'd still need the comprehensive plan approval for the project. Great, um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat, and I don't see any other raised hands at this time. Uh, then we are going on to Cindy Beard for uh, talking about um, indicators and the risk characterization. So Cindy, I am going to go on to the next slide. If you give me a second. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Joanne. Um, sort of a really important part of the cumulative impact assessment is to understand and describe the communities that are near the proposed new source. So with community input, the applicant will collect information on a range of characteristics and potential stressors in the community in the areas in, of environment, health, and social socioeconomics. Um, we're using several indicators um, for understanding each of these areas. And then all information will be combined into a report about the existing community conditions. This report will include maps showing the location of the proposed new source, other existing sources, where people live, go to school, and other indicators that we'll be showing you. The report will also include tables with data that will summarize these indicators. And finally, the report will contain a narrative describing the community conditions. The community input into this process is very important for identifying local concerns and knowledge about the community. Next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. Um, when we are um, looking at, um, sorry, previous meetings, we asked for your help in, to identify indicators that should be included in the cumulative impact assessment. We thank you for your suggestions and your thoughtful suggestions. Since then, we've continued identifying and evaluating indicators that are specific to Massachusetts. We've also shared our process for evaluating each of these indicators shown here. Our goal is to have indicators that are readily accessible to all people interested in the cumulative impact and have access to the internet. Provide information on a scale for evaluating the community surrounding a proposed source, are recent so they reflect current conditions to the extent possible and do capture the specific attributes as well as possible in order to provide a clear view of that attribute. The indicators that we're including can be quantitative or qualitative. In January, we shared with you that we had evaluated over 80 indicators. Since then, we have continued to evaluate the indicators leading to a proposed set of indicators describing community pollution burden and community population characteristics and vulnerability. In the next couple of slides, I'll be going through um, both of these groups of indicators. Next slide, please, Joanne. The first set of indicators I'll be discussing is the, um, the pollution burden. These indicators are grouped into three um, groupings. The first being air quality, the second being location of regulated um, sites, and the third being climate indicators. Indicators that have an asterisk by them are those that are under consideration, and in some cases we're still evaluating the best source to capture this information. So the air quality indicators that you see here are similar to those that you've seen in EJ screen. In fact, these all come from the US EPA EJ screen program. And these indicators are available as quantitative in quantitative form and are available as percentiles of compared to the state of Massachusetts. One indicator in particular I just wanted to point out is that the, the traffic volume and proximity indicator is an indicator that provides information on potential exposure to traffic related to air pollution, as well as um, ultra, ultra fine particles, which I know is a, is a a rising concern, but we don't have a good way to measure that. Um, the regulated site proximity indicator provides a list of facility types who location, whose locations will be identified within the area of the analysis surrounding the proposed new source. The specific climate indicators as indicated are still under evaluation and 
the source of those um, indicators is also um, being um, determined. The next slide, please, Joanne. So here I list the um, indicators describing population characteristics and potential vulnerabilities. These indicators are again grouped into um, three um, sections, the health indicators, the socioeconomic indicators, and locations of sensitive populations. Again, the asterisk indicates indicators that are under consideration. Both the health and socioeconomic groups of indicators um, include indicators that are used to identify environmental justice and vulnerable health communities as part of the um, 2021 EJ policy. As, and they also include others that we've identified through this cumulative impact assessment process. We've added to the health indicators um, the elementary school asthma prevalence for schools that are within the um, area potentially impacted by the project, and also are considering an indicator of um, premature mortality that would be able to sort of capture, it reflects uh, early deaths that might that arise from chronic diseases such as COPD and cancer. We're still considering several socioeconomic indicators, including indicators for unemployment and renter-occupied housing. It's important that these indicators are, represent one specific entity. Often they get combined multiple pieces of information. So we need to make sure that we have a, an indicator that is not duplicating elements that are, have already been included at, from individual indicators. And we think the location of sensitive indicators are really important to consider when evaluating the potential for exposure from a new source. These would be included on the map and the potential for exposure discussed in the CIA report. So to summarize, um, after we've evaluated the indicators su suggested by you, those used by other states for similar purposes and characteristics that we considered important to consider in air permitting, we developed this proposed set of indicators and um, these indicators also meet the criteria that we, that we described initially. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have about the um, indicators that we've proposed. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or any raised hands at the moment, but we can give folks a little bit of time to formulate their thoughts um, or questions. Oh, it looks like we have a raised hand. Yeah. Jay I, I, Hi, this is Lisa. I have a question on the elementary school asthma. Will that parameter be added to the DPH tool? Right it's, now, the MEPA EJ is not quite using that parameter. You know, the, the others, I you know, know that the data is definitely available. The um, elementary school asthma is available on the okay. um, on the DPH. Um, okay. Site. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, great. Um, next, we'll move on to Jay Andrew Irwin. Uh, do these, I, I'm just not as familiar with the DPHEJ tool, does it give you an ability to set the radius so that you can actually look at it? Because the short look I had, it just allows you to pick a point, but doesn't allow you to set a radius to find the uh, relevant information. They've added a, a, a tool, the drawing tool um, to their um, to their mapping tool. And that is one of the things that, you know, we will wanna have um, confirmed that that is something that is easy for people to use so that they can um, look at, overlay that on the maps. It's definitely something we're considering the ease of use and of acquiring these indicators. Yeah, and, and, and when you, and, and to the extent that it's just that those communities are present, we, and when we get the data, we, I guess we, if we have any portion of a tract, we get all of that statistic. There's, so the fine details of wh what portion of a tract would be included or excluded is still under um, investigation as far as how that would, how that would work. Um, uh, it's so enough at this point. I'm just asking that question because 
seems like it would be the details are going to have to follow. So the DPH data provide mapping and then the data sources that are associated with that that are available on the um, DPH website are um, available for most many indicators are available at a community level, some are available at a tract level. And the so you know, the data can be presented at a community or a track level. We haven't worked out the details. So EJ screen allows you to derive a report that sort of integrates the information within the one mile radius. That is not something that we have um, determined yet exactly how we want to have these reported out, whether we want to have it reported as an average across an area or whether we want to report the individual census tracts. And so that's something that will be sort of coming forward. And the tools that we provide in the end would be reflective of the information that we want to have reported. Thank you. And uh, Sandy, I just wanted to point out that the tutorial for the radius around a point facility is in uh, the EJ mapping tool, custom mapping, if that's where to find it. Thanks, Glenn. I meant to mention that. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to a question received in the chat. It says, I don't see elevated cancer incidence as a health indicator. Has it been eliminated? And if so, on what basis? So elevated cancer is a, um, it's a hard indicator to pin down. The um, cancer registry reports out cancers by cancer type. So we don't have a reporting of sort of all cancers like a total cancer piece um, available to us. We were also, um, you know, thinking, did we wanna, if we had looked at individual cancers, did we wanna have them just be sort of related to air exposures, but, or broader and um, so, instead of reporting out the cancer, and, so, and the other problem with the cancer is that there's relatively small numbers. And so then those can't be reported out at a census tract level or a community level. The only cancer that actually have enough, um, high enough um, incidence are um, lung and bronchus camp cancer. So that's the only one that is available across the whole state. Um, and so instead of trying to just focus on that one endpoint, uh, our thinking is that we'll be using this in indicator of premature mortality that captures um, the influence from sort of multiple types of chronic diseases and which include cancer and like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which are related to air exposures. Great, thank you for that clarification, Sandy. Um, it looks like those are the only questions we have at this time. Okay, thank you. So now I'll turn it over to um, Glenn Keith, who will be talking about how to conduct the air quality analysis. Thanks, Sandy. Glenn, it looks like you accidentally muted yourself. No, I actually did that, I'm sorry. I <laughs> My back. Yeah, there you go. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so the uh, I'm going to cover the uh, cu uh, cumulative air quality analysis, and, and just a reminder to uh, folks on the call. There, in addition to these slides, there was a companion document that gives a little more detail that is available. Um, hopefully, you all have seen that. But um, this is really, you know, in addition to the, the community outreach and, and engagement and, you know, characterizing existing community conditions, this gets to the, the heart of the actual cumulative analysis piece. And uh, this slide just summarizes that, um, you know, for the air quality analysis, uh, it would include, uh, you know, assessing cumulative impacts of both the existing and added air pollution uh, using a tool that we often use in air quality permitting is air dispersion modeling. 
uh, and also uh, thinking about how to evaluate significant local traffic and transportation emissions, which is generally not done in an air permitting context, uh, stationary permitting context. Um, and then those, uh, the results of that analysis would be uh, compared to standards, uh, national ambient air quality standards and risk management criteria. And you'll see in a minute that we are moving more toward a risk uh, characterization process for um, hazardous air pollutants or air toxics. And then um, coming out of this modeling, uh, we would uh, provide more transparency by um, you know, putting in guidance or requirements to display the modeling results uh, graphically to show the concentrations of pollutants at specific distances from the facility, which again, is often done in a modeling report, but um, it's, it's not always um, available. Um, and just a note about air dispersion modeling, because I know um, some people may not be familiar with it. It's, it's, the, it's a tool that is used, it's a computer software tool that's used to predict how potential new emission source will affect air quality. Um, DEP uses um, what's called AirMod. It's uh, put out, it's, it's used nationally by all the states. Um, and it, uh, it's a model that is, um, takes emission rates and source parameters and, and meteorological inputs, for instance, five years of meteorology to predict concentrations of pollutants at downwind uh, receptor locations on a, on a grid. And, and generally when we do the modeling, and it's actually the applicant and their consultants that do it, um, it's using a worst case analysis so that it uses maximum potential emission rates uh, for each pollutant from each emission unit and then combines that again with five years of representative meteorological data and then calculates the location of the uh, highest possible concentrations over uh, an area around the facility. And these are again worst case concentrations that would be then compared to applicable standards and guidelines. So if if the worst case concentration is meets the standards or guidelines then you know that there's not a significant impact to public health. Um, so that's what it, we're, we're um, referring to with, in terms of um, air dispersion modeling. And you can use that and it, it can be very detailed and you can see how the concentrations, you know, generally will decrease the further you are away from a facility so that you can determine where in a community and what concentrations or impact is being added. Um, in addition, the air quality analysis would describe the effect of the project on existing community in relation to the indicators. Now I'll come back to each of these points. Um, uh, a key thing that we're uh, considering as part of this proposal is um, actually having uh, lower standards uh, for certain uh, EJ populations based on the existing standards. And this is getting to the idea that there are certain populations that are more vulnerable that have um, been exposed to air pollution or other conditions that makes um, them more vulnerable. And so uh, the idea is that there would be more stringent standards to meet in this um, for, the, for air quality. Uh, the other thing just to note is um, we're uh, working on doubling the number of air toxics we, that would be evaluated if they're emitted. Currently we have um, ambient air limits and uh, for about a hundred, uh, air contaminants. And so um, uh, our Office of Research and Standards, where Sandy works, is um, uh, looking at doubling that to uh, around 200 and um, to, to, to capture more of the air toxics that might be of concern. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for criteria pollutants, um, usually in any permitting, we, we look at criteria pollutants separately from air toxics because EPA has published national ambient air quality standards for six pollutants um, that uh, are that have standards. Um, and so in the air dispersion modeling, uh, we would include the emissions, potential emissions from the facility, um, as well as emissions from nearby permitted air sources. And this is this is done today uh, in air dispersion modeling as well as background data from Mass DEP Air Monitoring Network. Um, and then all of that is added up and compared to the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards or 
uh, lower standards in certain environmental justice communities. And, and again, this would, this would meet, need to be to de, uh, determined. But the criteria air dispersion modeling uh, would be similar uh, to today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for the air toxics modeling and risk characterization, there's a, a significant change here from our what's currently required. Um, currently, only emissions from the facility are uh, modeled and then compared to um, uh, a, a screening level risk management uh, levels, which are the uh, ambient air limits that we have for about 100 chemicals. Uh, under this proposal, we would be considering including as we do today, emissions from the facility, but then also uh, emissions from nearby permitted air sources where that data is available. Um, and then um, instead of just comparing it to risk screening criteria on a chemical by chemical basis, um, this would require a cumulative uh, risk characterization. So you would then be able to add the risk from chemicals for all of the chemicals and then compare it to um, risk management criteria. And so initially the risk characterization would be a screening risk characterization of the uh, combined toxics uh, to ensure that the uh, levels um, are below the risk management uh, criteria of less than 10 and 1 million for excess lifetime cancer risk and a hazard index of one for non-cancer causing um, uh, chemicals. Or again, lower risk management criteria. And these uh, risk management criteria are the ones that are already used by the department in for total site risk for in the uh, waste site cleanup program, as well as in some other programs that uh, uh, develop standards based on risk. And um, if the uh, if these criteria cannot be met, then um, there would be the opportunity to conduct a more detailed risk characterization where you know, certain default assumptions could be changed to match the existing facility. Um, you know, a standard uh, risk characterization would assume 70 years of continuous exposure. But if for some reason, you know, this permits, this facility is only going to be around for 40 years, um, then, you know, that could be a, a, an assumption that's changed to 40 years exposure. But sometimes uh, there there are ways to do a more detailed facility specific risk screening um, characterization. Um, next slide, please. And then also included in this, the air quality evaluation characterization would be evaluating um, significant traffic and transportation emissions. Um, and this is an area that we're uh, exploring in terms of what are the best sources for data and how would this be integrated into potentially the air dispersion modeling um, it, and, or if not, or, or some, uh, some other evaluation. And there is uh, data available, as, as Sandy mentioned earlier, um, the uh, US DOT has traffic volume and proximity information. Um, we've heard suggestions that we could use, um, you know, the national emission inventory that which has uh, mobile source emissions from traffic um, and, and also model concentrations of traffic and emissions that come from um, EPA's air tox screen effort, which used to be uh, formerly known as NATO or the National Air Toxics Assessment uh, Program. And EPA is now updating that data on a much more frequent basis. They used to do it only every three years and now they're doing it every year. The most recent year data they uh, recently came out was in 2017. Uh, but this is definitely an area where we there's we need on there's ongoing research for you know the best methods to include community level traffic and transportation emissions. There is data available from Massachusetts DOT on average annual daily trips for you know major road segments. Uh, we do have other data uh, for Massachusetts and uh, a mobile source uh, modeling program called Moves that has um, you know, Massachusetts specific default types of vehicle categories. But you know, to, to really understand the emissions at a specific road, you would need to know what, what, what's the mix of vehicles there and would a default be okay to use or is there some other approach uh, or uh, to address the traffic emissions? So 
Uh, but we think that's an important piece of the evaluation, um, especially if you know if they're if the community is being affected already by significant traffic emissions, and um, we wanted to be able to take that into account in the air quality analysis. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and that's so that's that's the uh, the framework for the air quality analysis, and um, just take any questions. Great, thanks, Glenn. We'll start with one that came in through the chat. It says, is there any way to include in consideration alternatives? If there is a less impactful alternative facility feasible, can this be considered and whether a facility is permitted or not? This could be a way to not just see that facilities stay below the threshold, but go for the least impactful facilities possible. Right, can you just re uh, repeat the first part of that? Sure. Question. Is there any way to include in consideration alternatives? Right. Oh, I, I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in general, our, unless you are a major source, there's no requirement today for an alternatives analysis. Uh, the assumption is, you know, any facility has gone through some other process, local approval, and they've considered the, uh, the um, alternatives. And by the time they get to the air permitting process, they're, they're well down the road and um, submitting the air permit process. So, you know, some of these projects may be part of projects that go through the MEPA process where they would consider that, um, but that's, you know, that's, that's a good comment. We don't currently have uh, that type of requirement in our regulations. Um, so, but that's something to consider. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to Tom Keefe next. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your Hi, thank you. Um, I just had a question around, um, you know, it sounds like the analysis will be based on potential emissions. And while a permittee has some control over that, you know, in general, the way EPA and Mass DEP structure the calculation of potential emissions, often they're well above what a facility actually emits. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if everything's based on potential, when you take your own potential emissions and then however many facilities are in your analysis area and add those on top, you've really got a picture that's not um, accurate. And so yeah. I'm wondering if, if you've given consideration to maybe looking at, you know, at least four sources around the permittee, whether there's any consideration of looking at emission history, actual emission history, and having that be the parameter rather than potential emissions at every facility. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I, I may not have been clear. I mean, when we do our air dispersion modeling, it's it's based on you know controlled emissions because there, there's there, um, and so, and then when we do cumulative analysis, we often will do that based on existing real real emissions and not just potential emissions. Um, so I think that would address your concern um, on that, but that's a good point. Okay, great, thank you. And I just wanted to say, I, I know we're stopping for questions here, with, but what I just covered was just really the first half of the air quality analysis. The, um, the second half is looking more at um, the project in relation to other community conditions as well, um, based on those other indicators, so. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Catherine Robertson, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, I just um, wanted to check to see if a facility is looking at major modifications and um, which results in, in, you know, when you're looking at the cumulative impact and if that results in exceedance of threshold, um, could that possibly trigger a no build option where they may be prohibited from modifying um, an existing facility because that area is already saturated with you know um, emissions from traffic and other plants and that sort of thing thank you yes yes it, it could result in that i mean well uh, in terms of the actual permitting you know as it is today any permit uh dep would not issue a permit unless the emissions uh, complied with and met the standards. So what I think 
what I covered just in this section is, you know, having uh, both standards for criteria air pollutants, but also needing to meet the risk characterization management criteria. Um, so, yeah, and if those can't be met, then that that could result in a denial of a permit. Well, I just to clarify, maybe I wasn't clear enough. I meant um, because of the cumulative um, uh, level of pollutants in the region um, caused <clears throat> by other plants and other sources. Um, you know, even if this particular facility. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I, um, yeah, I think that's a possibility in terms of, and, you know, we, we still need to develop more details about how, you know, all these pieces fit together in terms of not only looking at, you know, the uh, facility emissions, but the existing community. But I think the idea is, I mean, obviously the, the goal is to protect public health. So if, if it's not gonna be protective to add a facility or increase emissions, um, then you know that wouldn't be a good idea to do. Thank you. Great. Moving on, we'll go to uh, Stacy Rubin. Thank you very much. I just wanna commend all of the MassDEP staff for their Fantastic work on this issue, which is very complicated. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just speak up in support of lower standards than the NACs for environmental justice populations. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, we do know, based on lots of scientific literature, that the NACs are not set at levels that are health protective. Um, and environmental justice populations are experiencing significant public health outcomes as a result of cumulative burdens. Um, so one question is, would you consider a lower standard or adding a standard for ultrafine particulate matter? And the reason is we just know that ultrafine particulates are associated with um, mobile source emissions, for example, and that is a big contributor to background emissions and conditions that result in public health risks. Thank you. Sure. And, you know, I... You know, I know ultrafines has been uh, raised as an issue, and there's no national ambient air standards. I, I, not aware that any other state has standards, and I, I have to confess, I'm not uh, uh, up to up with the science in terms of whether DEP itself uh, would have the um, has the capacity to develop stand air air standards for ultrafines. I would have to defer. To, uh, I don't know if Nan, uh, Sandy, if you're, you want to weigh in on this, but that it would be challenging to do that. But I, th I think um, it's a good comment, Stacy. I'd say that it's possible, but um, it would be it's you know sort of very complicated to develop standards because you not only have the toxicity component of it, but a standard also needs to be something that can be um, measured, monitored, and then you know, evaluated. And so there's, I think, you know, a number of pieces that might be sort of difficult, sort of in a near term, but it's, you know, I think something, you know, that could certainly be looked at as sort of a longer term, you know, type of project if that was something that was determined to be really important. Thank you. And we're trying to, we're advocating for um, funding and, and directive from the legislature to get some ultrafine monitors for you all. And I would just add that this is something that, you know, clearly we, we need to work at the with EPA at a national level. Um, I know it's an issue that's coming up throughout the country. So um, I think through the most recent EPA solicitation for community based monitoring, folks will be trying to do more monitoring on ultrafines. Um, and I think if we don't if we don't pick it up during the first phase of regulations, we could possibly pick it up after we do a program review. I mentioned the science and looking at research on an ongoing basis. This might be one of those issues, but I'm not saying we wouldn't, we wouldn't pick it up here. But just wanted to mention that. Great, thank you for your question, Stacy. Next, we'll move on to Jay Andrew Irwin. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask the question, as you're setting, Glenn, you made the comment that the current permits meet certain standards. We're talking about different standards 
for certain things in terms of the risk characterization, new compounds being added to the list. Is it in your plan that you will be conducting a baseline mapping of existing sources for those air toxics so that we have already, a, you know, what the existing burden is? Is there any thought to, to that being a resource available to the regulated community to know that it's basically in some cases, maybe a non-starter, just like you say a background. So as to speak is what is the predicted model background for these things? Right, yeah, and so just to clarify on the, um, you know, for the criteria air pollutants, we do generally include the background concentrations. For air toxics, we, we don't because we don't have good data, as you said. Um, and in this proposal, what we're doing is, is moving beyond just looking at the emissions of air toxics from uh, the proposed facility, but also, again, where the data is available, and that's, that's going to be a, an issue too, is uh, air toxics emissions from other sources. And then how that relates to potential background is, a, is, is, a, is another question. But I think the proposal is laid out now is looking at the facility uh, cumulative risk with other nearby permitted sources would have to meet the risk management criteria. Um, it's, we don't have a map of, of those concentrations. And again, it, it would also take into account transportation emissions. So we're gonna have to figure out how that would all fit together um, um, at this point. Yeah, I, and I apologize if I mixed the background with existing sources. And I think the point is, really to, to talk about it in the terms of what is the model of existing sources as that being a resource to, to have for people to right. be aware of what the current burdens are and even before you get to the issue of looking at additional. So just a, a thought for the yeah. planning process and a resource. Yeah, that's a good point. Great, thank you. Next we'll move on to Paulina Casasola. Hi, um, my name is Paulina Casasola. I work as a climate organizer at Clean Water Action, and we have a big focus on PFAS. And right now we're very concerned about an incinerator that is being proposed, a sludge incinerator that is being proposed uh, to be built in Taunton. And so I'm wondering if there's a way we can add PFAS into this, um, into the list of either pollutants that are or, or criteria on EJ screen, or how do we start measuring that? Because that might just get released into the air. I'm also wondering if there's a way to add other um, health issues like COVID rates that have impacted communities of color and low-income communities disproportionately, especially when we're thinking about air quality. Thank you. Sandy, do you want to take that one? Sure, sure. So I'll um, I'll I'll tackle the COVID question first. So the um, it is an important public health issue, but it's a relatively short term type of health effect that um, is something that um, sort of been advised not to include. It's been recommended that we not include COVID as an indicator since it's a sort of an ongoing kind of piece and it doesn't represent something that's easy to capture. So that's sort of the COVID question. And um, but the PFAS, yes. Um, we, as a department, um, the Office of Research and Standards is um, reviewing the um, ingestion um, standards or drinking water standards as part of our three three year review and we are um, that will take place in a in a couple of years another year and a half I guess will be sort of the time period for that um, piece the air um, is a, an area of active interest we are researching that now um, and tracking that issue we are aware of the facility um, in Taunton. And um, it's 
not out of the realm, but it's not something that we have um, information on right now, but it's something that could be available in the future. It's a, it's a very um, fast moving um, world, this PFAS world, and there's a lot of um, pieces to um, consider. So I think it's something that could be on the agenda, but it's, um, we're not there yet for um, adding, for saying that we, for me to be able to say that we would be adding it. it there's a lot of different pieces to consider. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Paulina. Next, we'll move on to something we received in the chat. It says, does DEP anticipate that model inputs for nearby sources would be available electronically or would that data be provided by DEP on an application by application basis? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, we will have to think about that. Um, I think, you know, certainly um, we would, to, to the extent that we have model files, we, we could, we would provide them on an application basis. I'm not sure about posting those ahead of time. They're quite large and we, uh, you know, we do have, that's a good question that we'll have to think about. Great, thank you. Um, and this last one is just a comment. It says from the Berkshire Enviro Action Team, we're also hoping to monitor for ultra fines in Pittsfield through the EPA grant if we get it. It's just a comment from them. Um, it looks like those are all the questions and comments we have at this time. I think there's one in the chat. Um, oh no, there's not, Never mind. Okay. Um, all right, so next slide. Um, so the, the other piece of the uh, air quality or cumulative impact analysis is to look at, um, you know, the potential emissions on the existing conditions. So um, as we've covered, you know, there'd be a, a looking at and a characterization of what are the existing conditions in the community. Um, the air dispersion modeling that we just discussed is really focused on air pollutants, but we know that there are concerns about, you know, non air quality indicators and other impacts. And this is an area that we've, you know, thought a lot about and other states have thought about, you know, some states have developed, you know, comparative scoring systems, but there aren't really um, uh, today methods that give you kind of a quantitative way to um, add up these impacts. Because when you think about what is a cumulative impact, it's you know impact of A plus B plus C equals some total. And when you're looking at things like, you know, numbers of, um, you know, for instance, hazardous waste processing facilities or recycling facilities or landfills, they all have different impacts and they're not, e it's not easy to figure out what the actual impact is of some of these conditions and then to add them up um, and, and compare them to some standard. And so this is an area where at this point, what we would be requiring is, is at least a discussion and an analysis of how, how do the potential, in, the impact, the emissions from the project um, affect or interact with existing community conditions. So, and this would be based on looking at the indicators in the table that um, Sandy went over, but you know, this would be a, a, a more of a qualitative analysis. And I know that sometimes we do see these in, you know, uh, you know MEPA reports or even in air permits at times discussions describing the conditions and then would this facility, how would it affect the community? And so, and again, this is an area that's gonna require, you know, con continue, continued research uh, and analysis. EPA, uh, as Joanne mentioned earlier, they have their Office of Research and Development. They've put out a, a very useful uh, white paper that's identified a lot of the the challenges with conducting cumulative impact analysis and the work that is needed um, in, ter in terms of, you know, new methods are needed to inform cumulative impact assessment. And, you know, how do we combine quantitative and qualitative data and stressors? How do we characterize the cumulative impact um, across, uh, uh, you know, spatial and temporal um, factors? And then, you know, developing uh, 
these stressors and indicators that there's you know data gaps there's uh there's also you know uncertainties with a lot of the data when you're looking at all these disparate impacts so that's just a uh one way to state that this is an area that we're going to continue to look at but at, at this point in this phase of the regulations we would be proposing to require a, a qualitative analysis of the project in relationship to the community and this is in addition to kind of the um the standard air dispersion modeling and looking at the air mission specifically um, next slide so the uh, the next step in this would be, you know, submitting the permit application or developing the permit application and the cumulative impact analysis report. They would file this with DEP, and this again uh, provides an, there would be an opportunity for additional public input. Um, so when this um, an report and permit application is submitted, similar to today, to today um, for these. Uh, permits that affect uh, potentially affect environmental justice populations the community would be notified of the availability of the application so dep is starting its review and they could also read the cumulative impact analysis and while dep is doing the same the community can certainly can uh, uh, provide comments to mass dep uh, so that we have additional input uh, to inform our review even before formal public comment um, after DEP's review, then DEP would issue, uh, as we do today, a proposed uh, permit decision. And um, this would be subject to a formal 60-day public comment period, which is um, twice as long as what's currently required for comprehensive plan approvals. Um, we currently require 30 days. Uh, so we're, we would make this 60 days, given that there's also a cumulative impact analysis to review and that um, to give the public more time and then when, after the public comment period, DEP would issue a final permit decision, approve, uh, approve with conditions or, or deny the permit. Um, and next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, this slide summarizes some of the, the concepts and that are new in the CIA permit process, like how does this differ from how we do air permitting uh, today, and it requires the uh, the pre-application community notice and stakeholder engagement, which is new. Um, and then, and this would be again similar to what e uh, the MEPA office has developed. It re would require assessment of the existing community conditions based on the indicators that Sandy covered. Um, there would be more air toxics that uh, to be evaluated uh, versus today. And then there would be uh, cumulative air toxics, air dispersion modeling versus just pollutant by pollutant, and then cumulative risk characterization. Um, and also consideration of significant traffic and other transportation emissions that um, affect, uh, you know, potentially affect the uh, community. Um, and then again, no, more detailed air dispersion modeling results. So it's clearer uh to the public you know what the how the emissions from the facility and the concentrations in the air um, might affect them and then a description of the impacts on the community um, and possible mitigation actions as well uh, we do anticipate that you know through the cia process that um you know applicants uh could uh you know engage uh, the community and develop mitigation actions as part of this since you know you're adding uh, additional air emissions that could affect people's health and then the opportunity to uh, comment during mass dep's review um, that would be an informal opportunity and then the a longer public comment period so these are some of the ways that under this proposal would be different from our current air permitting uh, process next slide please and uh, with that, we will stop for questions. Great, thanks, Len. Uh, we'll start our questions off with Katherine Robertson. Katherine, feel free to unmute. 
sorry, I was complimenting you. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody um, who's been working so hard on pulling this together um, for involving and engaging all stakeholders that will be impacted by the CIA requirement. Um, it's really appreciated how thorough you've been and how much you've listened to, to all the different uh, viewpoints on this, so thank you. But something that's been playing through my mind um, through this whole thing is um, how on earth are you guys gonna pull this off? It seems like a lot of uh, the responsibility for making sure that the information, the regulations are in place, the information is in place. Um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty onerous task. And, you know, I, and I know that DEP is committed to both um, expeditious permitting and robust community engagement, community process, because um, there are a lot of stakeholders out here that are concerned. Um, do you guys have the staffing to do it? And, you know, what can we do? Um, as I think this is something both the environmental justice and the, um, the uh, industry uh, facilities folks can agree on. Um, what can we do to support you to, you know, have the staff you need to, to make this work? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, certainly we're going to need to, you know, I think to date with these meetings, we've, you know, presented very, fairly high level and broad uh, conceptual thoughts. This is more detailed than previous meetings, but we're, we're there's still a lot of technical details to work out. Um, you know, and, and specifically, you know, for instance, related to the transportation emissions, how, what's the best way to account for that? Um, and then, you know, there will, there will have to be further discussion as well about, you know, lower standards. How would that be done? What criteria? So um, we, we certainly need um, additional, um, and we will be planning additional, you know, uh, consultation with with stakeholders as well as larger meetings to to delve into some of the technical details so that's one way people can help especially you know there's a lot of consultants i know that that do this that's their it's their their jobs to prepare permit applications and uh you know these types of analyses so they've got a lot of experience that we could certainly um benefit from and get input from them as well as well as other community members um, and we appreciate the interest that has been shown so far because this is a complicated issue. Let me just add to that. So I, I think um, we have had been fortunate to have some contractor support in this project through through Apton and uh, ERG. So that's been really helpful. And you know we've we've identified a number of areas where where we need to have additional data. We're going to need to issue a additional guidance, things we're going to be able to need to provide with folks preparing air permits, work we're going to be able to do, have to do with the stakeholders, including the environmental justice populations. These are all on our list of things to do. Um, so um, ultimately, um, we are going to have to have you know, a plan in place on how we're going to get this work done, not only to propose the regulations, but I think more importantly, to implement them once they're adopted. And um, we have talked a couple of times today about program review, we see this as the, the, fir the first set of regulations will be the starting point. It will not be um, where we end up ultimately. Um, as many of you know, we have um, done many modifications to our air regs over the years, and this, we expect this to be no different. So appreciate your uh, comment and your support and, uh, and uh, consideration of the, the task that we're that we're uh, working on but we think we're making quite a bit of progress so thank you great we'll move on to um, questions received in the chat first one saying will the measuring of cumulative air toxins consider the known interactions among them that can make them more hazardous Hi. So, um, it's the generally the um, thought is that at the concentrations that we would regulate at are below the levels where effects would occur. So, the addition of um, sort of multiple chemicals that might um, act on the same um, 
tissue or organ, you know, if it's a respiratory irritants, the um, thought is generally that those would be not sort of additive um, towards each other. It's certainly something that we take into consideration when we have concentrations that are higher than the, um, than the, than the risk-based levels. Um, so I think that's a really good question. Um, but we, at this point in time, we haven't, you know, set aside a particular um, place for evaluating that. And it's not typically sort of evaluated based on this idea that if you're below a threshold for, at a concentration that's below a threshold, then you would predict that you wouldn't have sort of this cumulative additive effect between chemicals that act on the same um, system like the respiratory system. Great, thank you, Sandy. Our next question says, in addition to air dispersion modeling, is mass DEP considering using a tool such as California's heart model to quantify health risks from proposed projects? Um, right now we're looking at, you know, air dispersion modeling. Um, I'm not familiar, what was the name of the tool in California, the heart tool? <laughs> Harp, uh, maybe it's pronounced H-A-R-P, but it's Harp. Tool, yeah, I'm not familiar with that tool, but I mean, you know, if um, we can certainly look at that. Okay, perfect. Um, next we'll move on to Stephen Chiron. Hi, just, just back to the uh, risk characterization um, standard. I know in the, in the BWSC world, I believe it to be the case, and Andy, if you're still on, you can correct me. Um, when DEP sets the uh, method one standards and so forth, they do, like for the hazard indexes, they do assume that there are multiple um, contaminants or contributors to that um, standard being set. Um, is that the case with the toxic uh, standards that are set for air or are those um, completely set based on that one chemical. I, I think it's talking about the 20% on the TELs, Sandy. Oh, on the, the relative source contribution. So with the, the current approach that we've been using with the, um, using the TELs, we would assume that there are multiple sources of exposure and that's the reason why we include the relative source contribution factor so that the, which is you take the toxicity value and you reduce it so that it's 20% of the toxicity value to sort of account for the exposures to other chemicals and from other sources other than sort of the ambient air. With using the risk characterization approach, the total hazard index, you know, so this that we're proposing would be a hazard index of one. So each, the contribution of each chemical would be less than one. And we would look at, then we would add them together. So, um, so that, let's see, I lost my train of thought. Okay. So yeah. we wouldn't we have like, we wouldn't need to have like a relative source contribution factor because that's part of, setting a guidance level that is sufficiently protective, where in this case, we're looking at concentration and comparing it to the um, toxicity value. And then all the chemicals added together should be less than there's a total threshold of one where we wouldn't expect yes. to have any effects if the hazard index is one or below. So that would be a kind of the case you do a screening approach. And then if you did a site specific risk characterization where say you only had a couple compounds uh, contributing from your source, you could potentially use site specific data and, and um, use another factor other than the 20%. We're not going to be using a factor of 20% within the risk okay. um, characterization. There, It's concentration, Those. you know, modified by the toxicity factor and calculating either the hazard index or, or the cancer risk. So there's no 
20%, but we are assuming that it is a lifetime in the screening approach, assuming that you are exposed for 70 years, 24 hours a day to that concentration. That those could be modified, those assumptions could be modified if you were doing a site-specific risk characterization. But within the screening approach, we want to assume continuous exposure, which is consistent with um, our current assumptions that underlie the, um, the guidance values for the air toxics. Okay, thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Stephen, for your question. Um, it looks like we don't have any additional questions or comments at this time. So I think we're to the wrap up slides. So I'm going to continue on. Um, I would just like to indicate we've talked about this. We, we um, uh, Mass DEP obviously still has a lot of work ahead of us. Our next steps, uh, we need to work on drafting the regulations. It's obviously quite a bit of detail we're still working on. Uh, we're developing a risk assessment tool developing guidance to support the regulation and we were still looking we will still be looking for um, stakeholder input um, uh, there's opportunity for further input we've done this in previous stakeholder meetings uh, there will be a survey monkey um, a mechanism for which we will ask for input uh, from you now you could either provide input that, that you haven't expressed, or you could use it to document uh, the input you've already given. We're happy to have you do that. Because we had given the um, framework in a written document um, and we didn't ask specific questions here, we were really looking for and got some great input from you today. So we're pleased with what was elicited during this meeting. We actually just did on this survey monkey this time is just the main categories of the framework and just asked openly for your input, similar to how the meeting went. So uh, feel free to either you know restate um, your questions there or your input or ask any other new question um, or, or provide any new input you'd like us to receive. So please make use of that if it's convenient to you. Um, and then obviously all these materials and including the framework as Glenn mentioned earlier um, <coughs> are on our website. So here is um, what we've provided before um, the website. Uh, we have an email address as well that you can always provide. We have all the, the MEPA um, information um, if you want to be on the distribution list uh, for our process, for the MEPA process, the website address for both, and then again, the survey information. And then finally, uh, when you leave the stakeholder, when you leave the meeting, Zoom will automatically uh, direct you to a short evaluation just to give us some feedback on how the meeting went and any um, input you want to give us anything pros or cons and so forth it's, it's always good for us to get a little bit of feedback so <clears throat> i'm just gonna wait a few minutes and then uh, we'll end the meeting in about one or two meetings but uh we really appreciate it. it was great great interaction today we really appreciate your um thoughtful input and comments and participation so thank you very much Meeting's going to be ending. We'll we'll all wait here for a minute or two, and then we will um, uh, actually shut down the uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.